This is uh, Bias Security in track six uh, with John Butterworth, Corey Hallenberg, and Zeno Kovac. There, uh, this is a real, real full talk, so there won't be too much Q&A. There will be a little bit in the hallway afterwards. All right, hello, I'm Zeno Kova. I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves once they start talking. So uh, we're gonna be talking about biosecurity and in particular a uh, defensive system that we developed that we call BIOS Chronomancy. Uh, we're trusted computing researchers at the MITRE Corporation and MITRE is a not-for-profit company that runs six federally funded research and development centers for the US government. And um, a little more about MITRE is we've been around for quite a while since the 50s when we spun off from uh, MIT Lincoln Labs. And at the time, you know, we, we aren't military, we aren't government, we aren't educational, we're not an ISP. So actually the .org was made specifically to uh, accommodate our sort of miscellaneous on the ARPANET. And uh, if you know of MITRE, the primary place you'd know of it is from CVE. So we manage CVE as well as a number of other uh, standards. And uh, KPEC people asked me to, to promote that. So KPEC is Common Attack Pattern Enumeration, enumeration and uh, Characterization. And it's basically a standard way to identify the way that people actually do attacks. So you should uh, check that out. So um, first of all, why do we think people should care about biosecurity in general? Well, uh, it's the first code that runs on a PC and therefore it's, it has to be the most trusted code because if an attacker gets in and has code execution from the very beginning, then they can compromise any, uh, any code that runs thereafter. So um, just as we see with boot kits, they run before an operating system and they compromise an operating system. If you run in the BIOS, you can compromise everything that comes afterwards. Uh, additionally, there's, you know, BIOS is kind of out of sight, out of mind right now. And uh, so no one is uh, pervasively checking their BIOS and integrity checking whether anyone's actually infected it. Um, and if someone were to infect your BIOS, they can sit there for a long time and we're not so much concerned about them, you know, just going lower and then beaconing out with normal command and control like you see with uh, normal OS level malware. We're more concerned about the fact that they could get in the BIOS, sit there, listen, and for instance, wait for a uh, kill command and uh, wipe the BIOS and subsequently that's the kind of attack where you can't remediate that without sending hardware back to the uh, manufacturers to reflash the, the spy flash. So uh, also, you know, why should you care about biosecurity? It's just cool because it's, you know, not well known and uh, it's very powerful and, and we think more people should know about it. So we specifically got interested in biosecurity partially because of, you know, the talks circa 2008, 2009 at Black Hat and we sort of worked our way towards this. Um, we were working on other kernel stuff at the time. But as trust computing researchers, we wanted to understand exactly how the, t how the technology worked down at the BIOS level. So in the trust computing specifications, they say things like, you know, we've got this immutable root of trust down at the lowest level and that starts off all the measurements and then each phase measures and goes to the next phase. But we wanted to know how does that actually work and so we dug into that. And obviously we wanted to know if an attacker could subvert this and uh, it turns out that that's true. So subsequently we utilized some of our existing uh, work that's adapted from academic work and we think that this builds basically a better measurement system down at the BIOS level and that's the BIOS chronomancy stuff that we'll talk about uh, at, at the end. So basically the, the high level overview is we're going to say you know, the attacker can get into the BIOS, you know, how could they get in? It could either be through misconfiguration or through exploits. Uh, you know, how does this trusted computing technology actually work down at the BIOS level? How can an attacker attack it? How can they subvert it? How can they make you think that everything's still working exactly the way it should when it's not actually? And then we'll talk about our defensive system. But so before we get into that, uh, I wanted to introduce uh, Rick Martinez uh, from uh, Dell. And so we wanted to have him come up and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what Dell has been doing for biosecurity because our work is specifically looking at uh, Dell Latitude E6400. And so um, a couple of years ago I saw Dylan Bresford's talk about SCADA security and uh, you know he found attacks in Siemens SCADA systems but uh, he, he allowed the Siemens people to come up, provide themselves as a point of contact so that other researchers who are working in the area can know exactly who they need to go to if they want to uh, talk about problems. So uh, Rick's been great to work with and so we wanted to let him say a few words. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Rick Martinez, as Zeno had mentioned. Um, I'm the biosecurity architect for the end user computing solutions group at Dell. Um, I've been in BIOS, been doing BIOS for over 13 years now, and uh, 
I've done a lot of lead security uh, work for the BIOS and I've recently, past few years, transitioned more into an architecture role uh, where I'm handling the architecture and strategy uh, for security technologies um, that, imp that uh, impact the BIOS. Um, I want to thank uh, Zeno, John and Corey uh, for uh, letting me assist in their research um, and letting me uh, say a few words today. Uh, they've, been, they've been great to work with and I uh, look forward to, to working with them again. Um, so I've got my contact information on the slides. Um, why, what would possess me to put my contact information in front of a black hat audience? Um, it's because I'm interested and I'm serious about biosecurity and I'm, I'm serious about uh, improving that security. Uh, Dell's interested in security. Um, you've seen it through from our acquisitions uh, in the marketplace. Um, we take a layered approach to security from the infrastructure um, to the endpoint to the OS. Uh, but you can't have a layered uh, a, a layered take on security without a very strong foundation, and that's the BIOS. Uh, so I'm interested in and very serious about um, improving um, the security of our BIOS foundation um, for the rest of our uh, security stack. <laughs> so, um, again, sorry, my, my contact information is on there. Um, if you're doing any kind of BIOS research um, or anything with Dell platforms in general, um, feel, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, let's work together uh, to kind of harden um, that security. Uh, we've also got a, um, an actually an external uh, incident re response team um, in process that we're getting ready to roll out and we'll have a, a public email address that you can, they can use as well if you don't want to uh, contact me directly. Um, so uh, with that, let's, uh, you know, enough about me, let's talk about the, the platform that, that we're going to be discussing today. Um, so the Dell Latitude E6400 uh, is one of our uh, older commercial uh, platforms. Um, a notebook system. Um, it was launched in August of 2008, about five years ago now. And uh, it's, uh, it was built upon the legacy BIOS. Um, and if you're not familiar with legacy BIOS, it's a precursor to the modern UEFI BIOS that you may uh, be familiar with. Um, it was written uh, entirely in x86 assembly language. And uh, the uh, TPM or TCG implementation that's on that BIOS uh, was implemented specifically for BitLocker and for BitLocker um, compliance. So um, it was a little bit of a different security landscape back then and um, uh, it was actually the last generation of legacy BIOS um, on our latitude systems. Um, I don't want to steal uh, the researchers' uh, thunder too much, uh, but we do have a new BIOS available uh, as of the 16th of July. Uh, it's uh, revision A34 uh, for the E6400. Um, so after your, uh, you hear their uh, great presentation, uh, please be sure if you have an E6400 to go download that and, and update your BIOS. Um, just real quick, I want to uh, end with this, and uh, like I said, uh, the E6400 was, uh, was built on, on the legacy BIOS framework, um, specifically for Vista BitLocker. Since then, a lot of great um, technologies have come across for BIOS, um, and we're, um, we've implemented them, um, starting with the UEFI transition, um, the uh, NIST 800-147 uh, BIOS protections that have been implemented and most uh, recently Secure Boot. You might have heard of uh, some of those uh, during uh, Yuri's presentation earlier this morning. Um, so that's all I have. Um, thank you for uh, letting me speak. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Yep, so, um, you know, we did this work on the E6400 basically because it was a target of opportunity. We had debugging hardware which would fit this and we happen to be using E6400s internally at MITRE. So part of the point here is, you know, it, legacy systems tend to stick around for a while. So uh, the types of problems that we find here are, you know, potentially found on other machines. And even if you have old machines, if your organization doesn't do BIOS updates, you're going to be sitting around with vulnerable BIOSes uh, scattered throughout your environment. And, you know, how many, how many back doors and BIOSes does it take for the attacker to maintain a persistent, uh, a persistent hold on your network for years or decades potentially? So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Corey and he's going to talk about how an attacker potentially gets into the BIOS. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is all assuming that the attacker can actually get into the BIOS. And uh, there are actually some chipset mechanisms that prevent an attacker from just writing directly to the, uh, the SBI flash that contains the BIOS. Yuri was um, mentioned this as well. Um, 
But on a lot of modern systems, these are locked down, so you can't just do this sort of thing where you can just write directly to the flash and uh, corrupt the BIOS. So what we found at the E6400 was that their 829 BIOS revision, um, they weren't locking down the BIOS, this was a, a while ago, but when A30 came around, they were locking it down and they, they supported signed BIOS enforcement so that you couldn't just overwrite the, uh, the flash chip with anything that wasn't signed with a Dell private key, so that's, that's good security. So, um, we still, as an attacker, want to talk about how we can get a, um, an arbitrary image on the flash chip even in the presence of the signed BIOS enforcement. And so essentially you, what you have to do is uh, exploit the BIOS update process to do something like that. Now uh, something similar to this has already happened. In 2009, uh, Invisible Things Lab showed an exploit, memory corruption exploit against um, a, an Intel BIOS that allowed them to reflash with an arbitrary image despite this signed BIOS enforcement. And uh, we found something similar that affected a number of Dell systems, including the E6400. Okay, so um, our, our attack service here is the BIOS update process. We're going to try to corrupt it somehow. And uh, to, before we can do this, we really need to understand the attack surface and understand the Dell BIOS update process. So for the E6400 at least, um, the way this breaks down is the, uh, the BIOS update image is called in Dell terminology an HGR image. And uh, what happens when you want to update your BIOS is that the operating system packetizes this HDR BIOS update image, which can be uh, many megabytes in, in size, so it can be quite big. So to uh, handle that, they'll split it up into smaller packets, and uh, these kind of get written across the address space. And then a bit in CMOS is flipped that indicates, all right, there's a BIOS update pending. And then the system reboots, and whenever this reboot happens, the BIOS is checking, is this CMOS bit set? If so, go out and find the pending BIOS update and, and do the process. And this all happens in system management mode. Okay, so this is just a little uh, visual depiction of what actually is happening. You have the operating system kernel driver taking this big HDR image and splitting it up into uh, what's called uh, RBU packets in, in the Dell terminology, and they're just split all across the address space, and they're encapsulated by some head header information which thing says things like the sequence number, the size of the packet, uh, et cetera, that just helps the update routine reassemble the, the BIOS update image from those individual packets. So you can see here, this is actually the, um, what would happen after the reboot, the system management mode update routine is literally traversing through the entire RAM address space looking for these uh, RBU packets and it identifies them by this special string dollar sign RPK on like page align boundaries that indicates that an RBU packet is there. And then as it finds them, it collects them and then uh, combines them in this reconstitution area where eventually the entire uh, Dell, you know, BIOS update image is going to end up. And not until this occurs is the uh, signature, signature check uh, happen on the BIOS update image. The reason is the, the RBU packets themselves, those RPK things, are not being signed because it's up to the operating system driver to split up the image and maybe those will be different depending on the, uh, the operating system resources. So those are completely unsigned. The attacker can control anything about the meta information in those. Only until that image is completely reconstructed can the signature check occurs. So anything that happens before that is fair game for trying to uh, find a corruption vulnerability in. Okay, so just to reiterate, our goal as an attacker is obviously to reflash the BIOS with an arbitrary image. And to do that, we're going to try, and try to find a memory corruption vulnerability in this reconstruction process that the BIOS update process uses. So uh, more specifically our attack surface is really those RBU packets I was just describing. And you can see here this is actually provided by the, uh, by like a SMBIOS library for Linux so you don't have to reverse this or anything, it's just freely available. And it's, this is uh, what encapsulates all those individual BIOS update image packets and it contains stuff that you would pretty much expect, stuff like the current, uh, you know, packet ID, the size of it, uh, what the sequence number is, et cetera, pretty generic stuff for this type of um, problem solving. So as I mentioned before, this 33-byte structure is unsigned. Uh, anything in here in the parsing of this is fair game for trying to find a vulnerability in. Oops. Okay, so getting into the nitty-gritty of how this update routine actually works, uh, what you're looking at here is system management mode code for the E6400. And this is what happens when one of those RBU packets is located. As soon as it's located, it starts to parse the individual packet. So in this case, um, 
It's copying some of those structure members into a global SMM data area. So things it's interested in like the, the set ID, the total number of packets, the size, the sequence number, et cetera. Uh, these are all just copied into this kind of SMM global data area and they'll be used for later calculations. And what's important to take note of here is there's not a lot of sanity checking going on, at least at this stage. Um, you can see it's just kind of copying it to this data area and they'll be used later for, for various things. Okay, so uh, one little corollary here that's worth mentioning is part of the, um, the Dell update process is actually in that reconstruction area I was referring to previously, it's going to fill with this GOR string, G-E-O-R, it's like an ASCII tag, and I'm not exactly sure why it's doing this, uh, we just saw it, the code doing it. I think basically it's adding this tag to the reconstruction space to signify where these individual RBU packets are supposed to end up in the reconstitution area, just as a debugging thing, so when they were developing this reconstruction algorithm, they could go in and, you know, debug it or something like that. But anyway, this thing is going to come back to haunt us and make exploiting this uh, pretty difficult. Okay, so getting to the actual vulnerability, um, just to cut to the chase, if you look down here at the, the second line, that rep move SD is an uh, inline mem copy. Um, so obviously we should be thinking like buffer overflow. And if you look at the size parameter, uh, ECX, if you look closely, you can see that it's like, um, let me see if I can point that out. Uh, yeah, the refresh rate's kind of bad, never mind. So that rep move SD at the bottom, that's inline mem copy. The size parameter is ECX, obviously, and if you follow the chain up, you can see it's derived from attacker data, uh, that HDR size, which just comes directly from the RBU packet. Okay, so, you know, the size parameter, mem copy, bad, buffer overflow, uh, we're definitely in business. Um, but the situation is actually quite a bit more interesting than that, which is why we're really going into, into depth about talking about this. So if you look closely at this hex rays output for this relevant code, you can see that the source, the destination, and the size are all influenced by attacker data. So normally where you only get the, uh, the size parameter, we actually control or influence at least the size and the source and the destination, which makes things uh, really pretty interesting. So exploitable memory corruption vulnerability in the update process. Uh, what's great about this is it's happening in system management mode and in SMM there's no things like ASLR, stack canaries, blah, blah, blah. So it, you're really free to pursue any target with impunity, nothing's going to stop you. And in fact since you're in system management mode, which is like the super privileged x86 mode, you can literally overwrite anything and nothing's going to stop you. It's not like you can go off the end of the stack and generate an exception, you can write over code, it's not going to be a segmentation fault, you can do anything and everything. Okay, so those are the good things, things that are working for us as an attacker. Unfortunately, exploiting this turns out to be quite tricky. Uh, number one, because to get to this vulnerable mem copy, you can see it's actually looking at the, uh, what effectively here is the, the destination for the copy, underlined in red, and it's checking to make sure the destination points to this GR tag, which kind of makes sense based on my previous description. It's making sure that the, um, the destination for the mem copy was previously filled in with this debugging tag, GOR. So um, this is going to complicate things. Uh, in fact, there's a number of other constraints that make exploiting this sort of uh, difficult. In general, the hardest part about this was the buffer where we're overflowing is considerably lower in memory than anything we want to overwrite, like many, many megabytes. So we're basically going to just trash a whole lot of the system RAM in an attempt to overwrite any function pointers. And uh, so it's pretty tricky to uh, corrupt that much data in the address space and not hang the system. And so that's kind of what we are working around. And we had to go in and find like we can overwrite this but not this and it won't hang the system, et cetera, and just come up with a list of constraints of stuff we can touch without causing a system crash. Okay, and uh, back to the, the source, the destination, and the size. These are basically how they're derived in that vulnerable mem copy. So what's uh, important to note here is that they're all derived from the same attacker controlled parameters. So this RBU packet structure is completely attacker controlled. The attacker can set anything he wants to for those things. Um, so notice if you want to change or like the destination source and size, I'll have the packet size parameter in there. So effectively what this means is if you want to change the source or the size, it's going to change all the other parameters as well. So it's a bit like you have a sliding window 
that you can corrupt and it, that window is going to change based on any number one of the parameters. So the trick here is to figure out the parameters so that that window corrupts the function pointers we want but does not hang the system and this is actually ended up being a pretty tricky problem. Okay, um, so I previously mentioned that the reconstruction area is filled with this GR debugging tag. Um, now this should occur naturally in the BIOS update process where this GR debugging string is written. Unfortunately, we kind of short circuit the update routine so that that does not happen. So you can see, let me see, the total data size right here. Well, first of all, we need this if, if still statement to uh, return one. If this does not execute and return one, then we'll never get to that vulnerable mem copy that we're basically trying to exploit. Oops. So we need this to run and notice that uh, forces total data size to be less than OX 800,000, 8 megabytes. Um, but we want to write more than that. So the way we kind of uh, get, our, get around this is we set the total number of packets to one. This is an attacker controlled parameter in that RBU packet. So total data size is zero. Good, this executes. Uh, but what's bad is it means this GR string basically is not does not end up being written the way we expect it to be written. And furthermore, we found that if we let this uh, mem set, which just zeroes out that whole reconstruction area first run, that would cause big problems as well, just zeroing out a huge amount of the address space. So unfortunately, to make this, to hit this exploitable condition the way we want, we're going to have to make it where the GR string does not occur there naturally. Okay, so that GR string has to be there, just to reiterate again, it has to be there to hit that vulnerable mem copy. So what do we do? Well, um, after thinking for a while, we actually sort of um, fakely generate this just GR string in the operating system. We wrote a Windows kernel driver that would basically write the GR string as high up in physical memory as it could. It would keep allocating higher and higher using mm allocate contiguous and as a Windows kernel function. Keep allocating as high as it possibly can. Keep writing the GR string so it's kind of like a GR spray or something like that of the address space. And then effectively we're abusing the same functionality that the BIOS update does where if you set up the system RAM and do a soft reboot, that RAM will actually stay in place. It's not like it's zeroed out upon a system reset. If it's just a soft reboot, the address space will for the most part stay the same. It's the same thing that the, uh, the BIOS update does. So we found that if we just spray the address space with GR and then reboot the system softly, we could actually have it where this would uh, stay in place and we could meet this condition. Okay, so there were a number of other constraints that I was sort of alluding to and effectively what we did was we just wrote something to brute force a possible RBU packet that would overwrite a function pointer that we care about. In this case, we just chose the return address for the uh, BIOS update routine and remember it's totally legit to go after this because there's no exploit mitigations in, in the system management mode. So overwrite that, don't crash the system, et cetera. And luckily we were able to uh, solve, you know, get a brute force at RBU packet configurations that will let us overwrite the return address and not crash the system, et cetera. And just to uh, give a visual depiction of what's going on, um, you can see here that with a, um, uh, it's a bit hard for you guys to see perhaps, but if you come back to this, you can see like for the RBU packet, the packet number is unusually high, OX83F9, and um, the packet size is FFFFE, so these things you normally would not see during a regular BIOS update process are obviously unusual, large, and malicious or whatever. And with those, uh, what happens is the, the reconstitution area for the, the BIOS update actually overlaps the system management mode RAM. So if we do this uh, cleverly, we can make it where we overwrite their return address being used by the update routine and then gain control of the instruction pointer within the context of the BIOS update routine. And at this point, we are free to reflash the BIOS with whatever we want. It doesn't have to be signed by anything. Okay. Do we have a YouTube mode? Okay, so this is just a, um, yeah, okay. So what I'm doing here is this is the E6400. I'm just going into the BIOS setup and showing you that in fact that, uh, you know, signed BIOS enforcement is turned on. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it might be a bit hard to read, but yeah, basically, sign bias enforcement is turned on. We can't just reflash the bias with an arbitrary image. Uh, the SPI is locked and everything, so you can't do something similar to what Yuri was doing. You can't just write directly to the flash. This thing is locked down pretty good. And what we're doing now is booting into the operating system, and we're going to run our uh, malicious kernel driver that's going to write one of these uh, malicious RBU packets to the address space and then uh, trigger the BIOS update process. That way we can try to exploit it and reflash the BIOS with an arbitrary image. And um, in Windows, this probably requires a kernel driver, but in, in Linux, you could actually do this just from user land from the root account. Uh, so it would be like a user land to SMM and BIOS privilege, privilege escalation. So from here, what I just did was ran the kernel driver. It set up the address space with that malicious uh, BIOS update packet. It flipped the CMOS bit. Now we're rebooting. Hopefully we'll trigger the BIOS update process and then, um, you know, get control of VIP. So, yeah, at this point the BIOS update process should be going, but clearly we had control of the, um, the instruction pointer. Basically that last screen which went away kind of fast was just showing this. So, you know, we have control of instruction pointer in the context of the BIOS update, uh, update routine and at this point you can literally overwrite the flash chip with whatever you want and the flash chip contains like the management engine and all kinds of other good stuff so you really have complete control of the system. Um, the other important thing to take away is that BIOS is actually responsible for instantiating system management mode. So once you have control of the flash chip, you have complete control of SMM as well and you'll be persistent in there. So this bug allows you to get control of the BIOS and system management mode for good. Um, and then once you have control of BIOS and SMM, you can do really bad things primarily because the whole root of trust in the system, things like what the TPM uses, is on this BIOS flash chip. So now John is going to talk about some of the really nasty malware you can implement once you have complete control of the system like this. Thank you, Corey. Hi, I'm John Butterworth and I'm going to present to you a, an example of a worst case scenario where the attacker is able to exploit a vulnerability like the one that Corey just showed you and install a permanent rootkit, uh, persistent rootkit into your firmware BIOS. Now technically, uh, modifying the BIOS with something like say a rootkit should be detected. Uh, in their PC client specification, the trusted computing group does lay out a set of critical boot time components which must be measured in order to uh, establish a trusted system. Now the uh, measurement of these components is referred to as the static root of trust for measurement, static being uh, because you're assumed to be measuring the same thing each time. Uh, each component is measured prior uh, to control actually being handed off to that separate component, thus establishing a uh, chain of trust, if you will. Now for this discussion, we're focused specifically on that first initial measurement, which is referred to as the core root of trust uh, for measurement, uh, the responsibility of which is to measure itself uh, as well as the BIOS. Uh, and because of that, uh, it forms a sort of anchor in this uh, chain of trust, as you will. And because it's also measuring the BIOS, therefore, technically, a uh, firmware rootkit should be detected. However, as I'm going to show you, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, first, a little bit of uh, terminology. We have the trusted platform module, the TPM chip. Uh, it's uh, located on the motherboard, has uh, multiple security features. Uh, the most pertinent to this discussion is the fact that it is able to provide a signed quote of its uh, current PCR set. Uh, it can also provide signed tick stamps, uh, but as you know, we'll get into that a little bit later. Now, these PCRs, uh, they are registers located on the TPM chips. Uh, they store 20 byte hashes. Uh, each of these ha hashes represents a, uh, one of these uh, measurements of these critical boot time components defined by the TCG. Uh, the TPM, uh, the PCRs rather, are reset to zero uh, upon reboot and they can only be modified via an extend function which is the SHA-1 hash of the current PCR value concatenated with the measurement, with the hash of the measurement that you wish to extend onto. Now this is an example of a measured boot uh, as, uh, as, as defined by the uh, trusted computing group. Uh, here we have our uh, core root of trust for measurement uh, measuring itself uh, as well as the BIOS and extending that measurement onto PCR0. Now as I stated earlier, uh, the CRTM is the only measurement which we are focused on. I'm just going to leave these here for reference as they are beyond the uh, scope of this discussion. Uh, this slide is just to show how our work in the trusted computing space uh, differs 
uh, from that performed in the past. Uh, past researchers have actually attacked the TPM chip, uh, like say with an electron microscope, trying to dig the keys out of like say the shielded locations that are uh, located on the TPM chip. Uh, we are actually focused specifically on uh, investigating the vendor implementations of these uh, static root of trust measurements. Now let's just talk about the architecture a little bit. Uh, this is the, an image of the Q45 Express chipset on the E6400. Uh, we have here, a, a, it, a, it consists of a CPU, a memory controller hub controlling uh, I.O. to system RAM, and we have an I.O. controller hub controlling I.O. to uh, various system devices like say the SPI flash, which is where the uh, BIOS resides, as well as the uh, TPM chip too. Uh, so we're just going to simplify this uh, into a simplified representation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the boot process now. Uh, when you power up your system, the CPU begins executing directly from the NVRAM flash, directly from the boot block, performing various generic uh, chipset uh, configurations. Specific to the Dell E6400, it begins to process uh, a number of uh, modules. Uh, some of these modules are very benign, containing uh, data such as the uh, splash screen, which you see upon system boot. Uh, others contain a uh, very important uh, executable code, like that which, like that code which will instantiate system management mode and its executable system management RAM space. And of course, uh, the CRTM is another one of these modules, which will execute and uh, extend its measurement onto uh, TPM's PCR0. Uh, specifically what that is measuring, I will uh, detail shortly. Uh, but first, I'd like to just uh, outline some very general problems with relying on PCRs uh, as indicators of a trusted system. Uh, for example, uh, there are no golden PCRs provided by the OEMs. Uh, it is up to you, the truster, the owner of the system, to determine that these initial PCR sets that you see are, in fact, uh, to be trusted. So you have to provide your own golden value, so to speak. Uh, there is also no description of what's actually being measured uh, to incorporate, uh, to, to create these measurements that you uh, read in the PCRs. Uh, in our research, we were surprised to see that homogeneous systems, uh, systems being the same uh, hardware configuration, same model, uh, same BIOS revision would actually produce different PCR values, uh, as well as we were also surprised to see duplicative PCR values uh, when we were dumping the PCR sets. As you can see here in the figure below, uh, indexes one, two, and three all share the same hash. Now what this means is twofold. Uh, one, uh, no new information is actually being measured and extended into those PCRs. And two, uh, what's defined by the TC Trusted Computing Group as a critical boot component that should be measured is actually not being measured. Anecdotally speaking, this hash is actually the hash of, uh, of an empty PCR value concatenated with the SHA-1 hash of zero. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what the uh, E6400's core root of trust of measurement is actually measuring. Uh, this is indicated above in this uh, diagram at the top. This is the BIOS, and those gray slices represent what this uh, core root of trust is actually measuring. Uh, these gray slices uh, consist of the first 64 bytes of each of those modules, which I had uh, described earlier during the uh, BIOS boot slides. Uh, and as you can see, the uh, core root of trust for measurement actually also is not measuring itself. Now, it's easy to look at this and say, well, that's the problem right there. If they are only measuring the entire BIOS, well, that would fix the problem. That's actually really not the case, as I'll show you shortly. Um, that's, that's, that is a red herring. The real problem is because the uh, CRTM is actually something you can modify. It's mutable. So, but regardless of that, you still want to uh, perform the measurements correctly. So there are some problems with uh, weak measurements. Uh, for example, uh, as uh, shown on the uh, previous slide, um, if you're not measuring certain components such as the PCI option ROMs and BIOS configuration, that is un ungood. Uh, you're not actually capturing those measurements. Um, it's also possible, looking, uh, judging from the, uh, what's actually measured on the previous slide, that you can actually arbitrarily modify uh, bits and pieces of the BIOS 
uh, without actually triggering any changes in the PCR sets as well. Uh, Yuri actually presented a similar discovery at Cansec West uh, 2013 uh, where he found he was able to arbitrarily modify the BIOS on his ASUS motherboard without triggering any changes in his PCRs. Uh, the takeaway from this is that this is not limited to a single vendor. Uh, this is an industry-wide problem, we believe. Uh, so, um, as I stated earlier, uh, regardless of how much of the BIOS is actually being measured, um, it is possible to, to still um, install a rootkit in, in there. So, uh, what if an attacker wanted to modify uh, any part of the BIOS, regardless of whether or not they're measuring the entire, the entire thing? Well, you can forge the PCRs. And this works because the BIOS is mutable. Uh, this is basically your standard run-of-the-mill uh, replay type of attack uh, where the attacker is able to either record or calculate the known good measurement uh, that's performed by the CRTM to uh, record that hash that gets passed to uh, the TPN to extend onto a PCR0. Uh, it's then able to modify the CRTM to prevent that good CRTM from running and then to replay its pre-recorded hash to the TPM uh, to extend onto PCR0, thus reporting your golden value, so to speak, of PCR0 that you expect to see even though the CRTM has actually been modified. And from there, the attacker is able to instantiate, to, uh, insert itself into system management RAM or any other part of the system that it wants to. So, as uh, Corey uh, hinted, there, uh, here's uh, an example of some uh, really bad things that can happen uh, when, when this is a possibility. Uh, just to show that this isn't uh, just paper analysis, we created two proof of concept firmware rootkits. Uh, each is installed programmatically. There's no hardware modification required uh, to do this. Uh, we created the tick and the flea. Both of these are persistent stealth malware. Uh, the tick achieves its stealth uh, by forging PCRs. And of course, once it's achieved this stealth, it's free to modify any other portion of the BIOS that it wants to, including uh, inserting itself into system management RAM. Uh, the flea has all those exact same basic stealth uh, capabilities as the tick, but it's actually also able to persist even beyond BIOS reflashes. So as a recap, this is just a, an example of a normal PCR zero measurement uh, where the CRTM executes uh, creates this measurement and extends that measurement to PCR zero. Uh, now, if there's a tick installed, it of course prevents the uh, good uh, CRTM from executing, takes its pre recorded hash value and extends that to PCR zero, thus pro pro producing the exact same PCR zero value as you would expect from a healthy system when clearly there is something else in your firmware. So now we have. A quick little demonstration uh, to show uh, the stealth capabilities of the tick. So what we have here is a BIOS uh, revision A29, uh, which is uh, it's just booted up. You just saw the Dell splash screen uh, for this. Presentation purposes, that splash screen is actually going to be the only trustworthy indicator that this system is actually something that can be trusted. And just as a little spoiler alert, you're not going to see that again. So this is our setup in the upper right hand corner. We have a kernel debug output which we're going to use to uh, grab our uh, PCR values uh, using our open TPM driver which Corey wrote and I will provide a link to its uh, open source. Now, so what we're grabbing here, this is actually our known good. Uh, this is going to be, this will serve as our uh, golden PCR zero value. Uh, this is an unmodified BIOS uh, which is just booted up and uh, we recorded that into a text file just so we can compare and contrast as we uh, go through the uh, boot process. So what we're installing here just to show that the PCR values will change. This is a naive uh, rootkit. Naive is a rootkit that we, we refer to as naive being because it has no stealth capability. It can be easily detected simply by observing PCR zero. So what we expect to see when we again run the open TPM driver and dump our PCR set and grab our value of PCR zero and compare it to our golden value, we expect that value to be different. So we're just going to get logged in here and perform that. Uh, 
just pause here real quick so it doesn't go too quick. But this, but indeed, uh, this uh, hash is different, and so the uh, this rootkit is easily uh, detected simply by observing the PCR value. So now we're going to install our tick. Now remember, the tick has that stealth capability where it forges the PCRs via the replay attack. So we just executed that. We're going to go through the update process again, and what we expect to see is that in this case, the PCR0 will actually match our first golden value of PCR0. So it will appear that nothing in the BIOS has actually changed. However, something has changed. Again, the splash screen has changed. Just a benign change. So now we're just going to get logged in here and compare our, our values of PCR0 to the initial value. We'll provide a link to the uh, open TPM driver as well in case any of uh, anyone here wants to uh, start dumping their uh, PCR sets. And indeed, uh, just pausing here real quick, this does actually match our golden value of the uh, PCRs. So it appears uh, that the BIOS is unmodified when in fact it has been modified. Now we're going to talk about the flea. Uh, as I stated earlier, the flea has all the same stealth capabilities as the tick. Uh, it performs the same replay attack it forges uh, PCR0. Uh, this remaining undetected. It's persistent uh, not only between reboots, just like the tick, but it's also persistent beyond BIOS reflashes. So whereas I just showed you with the tick, where you can't actually rely on the TPM to tell you that the system is clean, you also cannot necessarily rely on BIOS reflashes to tell you that to to cleanse your system of a, of a particularly nasty rootkit. So here's how the flea basically works. The flea has hooked uh, the BIOS update process. Uh, so it, of course, it's aware that it's about to begin. It clones itself into that BIOS firmware update that's in resident RAM. Once it's in there and all set, it simply permits the update process to continue. Thus, the flea has persisted to your newly updated flash BIOS. And again, we're going to see a little video displaying this aspect of the flea. Okay, let me just start this one over. Okay, so what we're starting here, we're actually starting, in the interest of time, we're just starting here with a, uh, with a system that already has a flea installed on it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to run through, we're going to perform BIOS update and just show that the flea actually does persist. I would be redundant to show the forging capabilities. However, I should mention that the that once the flea persists and uh, clones itself into the new BIOS update, it will actually forge the expected update for that for that BIOS revision. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, simply update our BIOS to BIOS revision A30 using Dell's utility, which you can uh, download uh, from their site. Uh, BIOS revision A30, at least at this time, uh, offered some uh, security updates. Of course, if you have an E6400, you should listen to Rick and install BIOS revision A34. <clears throat> we're going to go through the uh, update process, and like I said, we expect to see that the flea has persisted into this new revision. And as you can see, the flea has persisted to BIOS revision A30. It's a little bit dim there at the bottom. So I'm going to pass it over to Xenokova, uh, who's going to tell us how to uh, combat these uh, firmware rootkits. 
All right, so um, what we did then is, you know, we're defensive security researchers and we had some previous work that we had done in uh, Windows kernel uh, trying to apply, get better uh, roots of trust so that we can, basically we're worried about these sort of attacks specifically where the software can lie and say that everything's good. So uh, first of all, you should probably take down this uh, bit.ly link at the bottom. Um, there's about 10 years of work in the area that I'm going to describe and I'm not able to do it justice in the small amount of time that we have left. So um, we put up a timeline there that talks about all the other uh, work in this, in this area. But what we did is we created a system we called BIOS Chronomancy. And what it is is timing-based attestation or software-based attestation. That's uh, the terminology in the academic community. And what this kind of software is trying to do is you're building software with a very special construction where you're trying to say, this software will tell me that it is uncompromised. And if someone has compromised and is making it lie, it'll take extra time to actually run. So you're trying to build it specifically so that if it's manipulated, if someone's trying to put a hook into it, but then they're cleaning up and making it look like it's not hooked, it's going to take additional time to run. And this is the sort of timing side channel that we're purposely building into the software's execution. So um, the Bosch Chronomancy system is, we're not trying to re-implement the entire uh, static root of trust for measurement. We're not trying to measure the BIOS itself and then the option ROMs and then everything else. We're just saying we want this first root of trust. We've got this mutable BIOS, so we know an attacker can potentially get in here and modify it, and we want to have additional trust in uh, this specific software. So uh, again, there's, there's a lot of different assumptions with this. You should see the previous related work and, and our future paper on this to get them all. But the first assumption, and we think this is what makes this, this technique in general so appealing, is you assume that the attacker has full control of the system before you execute and even potentially while you're executing. They can do whatever they want before and during your execution, but the intention is you build your software specifically so that if they modify you while you're running, you run slower. Um, and then another thing, a big assumption here is that the code we've written is the most optimal way that we can check ourselves. So if an attacker can come in here and create a little better hand-coded assembly and make it run a little faster, he can add an instruction which would normally slow it down, but then he can combat that by optimizing some other instructions which speeds it back up and then we don't detect any timing changes. And similarly, we have to make sure that deep down at the microarchitectural level with all of the, you know, different ALUs and everything else that's available for the processor, we have to make sure there's no free slots where they can just add an instruction and because there's an idle, you know, subcomponent of the CPU, they can't just uh, use that for free. So all of this uh, related work, fundamentally it breaks down to having these uh, core premises. First of all, you're going to read your own code and your own data. So you're reading yourself in order to provide some evidence of uh, control flow integrity or code integrity. So you want to make sure no one's put a jump instruction in your code to hook you like, you know, rootkits commonly do on OS level software. So you're reading your own code, you're building a checksum over your own code. And unlike things like a malware where it's, you know, just trivially that malware or we'll check some itself to look for an analyst putting a breakpoint in it. Um, but we need to make sure that, um, that if we do this sort of check summing that it's going to cause a difference in the timing execution which subsequently gets measured. So then what we do is we read the data pointer which is pointing at our own code and our own data. We incorporate that into the checksum and the notion there is if the attacker takes our code and copies it off to a clean location, so they've got a clean copy of our code, when we try to read our own stuff they point us at the clean copy, well we incorporate the pointer itself. So they're pointing at some other copy, they're not pointing back at our own thing at our own location where we know it should be. They're pointing at a different copy and so they need to modify the incorporation of the data pointer which means they need to do, you know, maybe an add in and a subtract, for instance. And those two extra instructions are then going to perturb the uh, timing. Uh, similarly, instruction pointer. We're executing at a known location. We're reading data from a known location. If we incorporate those pointers and if the attacker is pointing them to different execution location, different data read location, then uh, they have to fix that back up during the checksum computation and that modifies it. Also, unlike this sort of, we don't want trivial replays, so there's not a fixed, like, here's our um, single checksum which proves that we're clean. We use a nonce in order to have freshness and make it so that you can't just keep replaying, yep, I'm clean, yep, I'm clean, and just have a, a plain replay attack like that. It also helps prevent pre-computation attacks where the attacker stores, like, every possible combination of challenge to response. So with a big enough nonce, you know, they don't have enough RAM to, to keep it around. 
Uh, and then the important thing is all of this incorporation of data into your self checksum, you do it millions of times uh, so that you're trying to make it so that if they add even one instruction of overhead, times millions of iterations, that means millions of instructions of overhead. So this is what it would kind of look like as C pseudocode. In reality, it's always hand-coded assembly because you have to have that optimality assumption. But the point is, you know, we're incorporating some of these things, the nonce, the data pointer, the data pointed to by the data pointer, the instruction pointer, we're mixing it around, and then uh, we're doing this all in a while loop. If the attacker knows that he's compromised your data, if he's modified your self-checking code and he wants to make it look like he hasn't, he needs to check. Are you, a, is the good code about to read some bad data? And if so, I'm going to give it the good data. And that's basic if kind of conditional. But by adding an if conditional, that's, you know, a couple of instructions extra that he has to do to clean up this checksum and make sure the checksum is still correct. And a couple instructions times millions of loops equals millions of instructions of overhead, millions of instructions equals uh, macroscopic timing difference. So overall, this is what our protocol basically looks like. Uh, we're down at the BIOS level. We don't, we, unlike some other things, we can't necessarily get a challenge from a server. So we're actually going to get our nonce from the TPM. We start out, we request from the TPM this special uh, type of measurement called a tick stamp. And all it really is is basically the TPM when it resets, you have a counter counting up. It's a tick counter. It's just like RDTSC on x86. Except the big thing that the TPM gives you is the TPM can give you a signed copy of that tick stamp so that you actually have some belief that this is actually coming from the TPM that you've provisioned and you have the keys for and you can check the digital signatures and so forth. So it sends back the time stamp that's signed. It also has a nonce that's built into it. The TPM makes a new nonce every time the TPM resets. You take that, you incorporate the data from the signature, which is going to differ every time because of the different nonce the TPM generates. Use that as the nonce for the self-checking algorithm. And then you run your millions of iterations reading your own code. And uh, subsequently, you then ask the TPM, what time is it now? So basically, we, we kind of think of this like a trusted stopwatch. You say, TPM, what time is it now? You run your self-check, which is specially designed so that it increases the amount of time if an attacker is manipulating it. And then you say, TPM, what time is it now? And you've got your time one, you've got your time two, so you've got the delta time. And subsequently, you can uh, use that. You say, here's a given CPU, here's it running at a certain clock speed. We know how much time this algorithm should take over this many iterations. So you just send back to a server to verify, here's the tick stamp one, tick stamp two, and the self checksum, and it can confirm that. So we did a bunch of experiments on this. Uh, you can see our paper later for it. But the key point is here is we took like 18 uh, E6400s just to show that this works across many systems. It's not just a one-time deal that we got to work on ours. And the basic point here is without attacker, it's low, and with an attacker, it's high. Um, but back here, the main point is if we don't run enough iterations, potentially we're on the boundary. So at 625,000 iterations, the attacker sometimes can get fast enough that his lower bound on his runtime is about the same as the upper bound on the, on the clean runtime. But uh, this is pretty easily dealt with because what you're really dealing with here is there's a percentage overhead that the attacker adds by adding a couple instructions is a couple percent overhead. So if you want a larger macroscopic difference, for a small percentage overhead, you just run it more times and you get more difference. So, um, you know, pretty clear in all these cases that uh, we have easy detection of the attacker um, that he's perturbing the timing. So uh, we know that this system gives us, you know, under the academic sense of it, it's a great thing because it's saying this code is unmodified, we can, you know, verify this, and that's all good. But uh, what we found when we dug into this is we said, well, that's good from the academic perspective, but in the practical perspective, we want to, you know, stop attackers from being able to, to do bad things. And kind of a big problem with this kind of technique is a talk to attack, time of check, time of use. So I check the system, and it says, yep, the checksum is right, the timing is right, this code ran unmodified. And that's great. That's a property which, quite frankly, we don't have for most any other security software out there. That's a good property, but it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but insufficient, as the academics say. 
uh, the attacker can remove himself from the system, allow a measurement to proceed with a clean system, and then, you know, reinstall himself after the checks. And so that's why, you know, this is kind of future work that we're working on right now. We're branching out into the peripherals. We know that there's been plenty of work in uh, the Black Hat community with, you know, infecting NIC cards, infecting keyboard controllers, and so forth. So we're concerned about uh, this kind of thing, and we're working on that because fundamentally we think that if you can't stomp out this kind of attack down at the BIOS level, it's not going to be useful at other higher levels. So the basic conclusions are, um, you know, we think you should assume attackers can get in. We think that this sort of uh, timing-based attestation system is built under that assumption, so that's a good thing. Uh, you know, Corey showed the ways that you can get in. Uh, Yuri showed ways that you can get in. The attacker gets in. We have to work under that assumption. Um, and then obviously bad things can happen because unfortunately when we have these um, mutable roots of trust that becomes untrustworthy once it's, it's mutable an attacker can get in. So, um, so one of the things I forgot to put on here, but it was in the sort of, uh, in the summary. So Rick mentioned how they started um, applying the NIST 800-147 guidance. That's saying, you know, apply things like signed updates and so forth. And they did that. They locked down the flash chip. They applied signed updates, and that increases the security. So going beyond that, part of our point of showing the flea was to say signed updates is, again, necessary but not sufficient because if an attacker is in there before uh, the signed updates are applied, he can just keep bouncing his way across new signed updates being applied. And similarly, you can have signed updates, but an attacker can exploit and get their way in. So uh, there's further NIST guidance. There's the NIST 800-155, uh, which is targeted at, uh, at vendors basically saying, here's the type of stuff we think you need to actually measure uh, in order to provide a good route of trust. And as trusted computing researchers, uh, that's the kind of stuff we care about. But uh, fundamentally, uh, as, as we mentioned a couple of times, the, the core problem here is that your core route of trust is mutable. And if it's mutable, then somehow, some way, we assume that the attacker is going to be able to get in and they can subvert your root of trust. All right, so the one last thing that we have to say, there was like a question in Yuri's talk about, uh, you know, what's the prevalence of BIOS misconfigurations? We've actually, that should be, uh, that should be live now. And we're, we released a tool called Copernicus. And what it does is it tells us about things like misconfigurations in the BIOS security. So if you've got a BIOS that's not locking down the flash chip, Copernicus will tell you that. It'll say BIOS, it, it gives us simple things like is SMM writable? Is SMM locked or unlocked? Is BIOS locked or unlocked? And so we've released the binary so you can just uh, go play with this and see on your own machine, are you vulnerable to a trivial wiping of your BIOS? Can it be trivially bricked? Also, uh, we care about this for doing analysis of the systems. So Copernicus gives us a BIOS flash dump. And then from there you can, you know, as we kind of talked about, there's problems with PCRs and that you get a hash, but then the question is, if you've got your nice trusted computing system and uh, hashes differed, then what, right? What are you going to do if someone tells you the hash of your BIOS is not what it should be? So Copernicus gives you the ability to like dump the, ha dump the flash chip and go ahead and start looking at it. Look at a clean one, look at a dirty one, diff it, throw it in IDA, and uh, that's exactly the kind of stuff we do. So, um, you know, MITRE works for, for the government, so f for anyone here who's a Fed, uh, basically uh, we're interested in doing uh, deployments, pilots within your environment so you can check, you know, how many of your machines are actually uh, vulnerable to trivial breaking uh, and also, you know, check, pull back the BIOSes and say, we have, you know, this is what we think the Dell golden image for a flash chip should look like on an E6400 or newer things. But if you don't have that, we'd like to, you know, actually analyze that and find out why. Uh, additionally, MITRE is a not-for-profit company. We don't make uh, COTS software. The best we've found out the hard way, we don't like to run science projects for many years at a time. So kind of this capability needs to be incorporated into commercial products. And uh, we're licensing this, and it's a very easy license because fundamentally we're going to be licensing it as data for code. So you give us data about how many machines you've seen vulnerable. We incorporate that into our next paper, which, again, Part of the reason for releasing the binary is we'd like people to go check your own machines and then tell us, you know, I've got this model and it's vulnerable. So our next paper is going to be basically how prevalent is this in the wild? What percentage of machines are trivially writable? What percentage have TPMs? What percentage have them on? All these sort of things. Which vendors do better than other vendors? You know, so if you care about this thing and you're doing purchasing, uh, you want to know which ones are actually locked down. So, uh, so we're looking to uh, license this to COTS and do... Uh, um, piloting in government in particular, but we're also open to doing it for, uh, for uh, 
just general people who are interested in finding out about their biosecurity because it helps our, our ongoing research. So unfortunately, uh, you know, we, we jammed packed it with like three talks worth of material, so we don't have a lot of time for questions. Uh, I see people queuing up at the back, so uh, we won't take them up here. We'll go right out there and right to the, uh, to the right, there's a little area that you can ask us questions. But our two last things that we're going to pimp here is uh, Corey's open TPM. If you want to start playing with the TPM, he's provided open source tools that you can do that. And then finally, um, opensecuritytraining.info. We've got classes on TPM, so you can learn about it. We've got classes on IDA Pro and reverse engineering, so you can learn about that. And John's going to be making a class on BIOS, so you can learn more about that. So with that, thank you.